morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Progress Seminar. This is the third and final session of the 2020 Virtual Progress Seminar. I'm your co-host, Kevin Mullen, and proud to serve as co-chair, uh, along with Supervisor Carol Groom and the CEO of Sam Cita, Roseanne Faust, uh, my partners in crime here with this 2020 Virtual Progress Seminar. We hope you have found the program uh, worthwhile thus far. Uh, we have another great day planned for you, a panel conversation with tech leaders and Senator-elect Josh Becker, who is waiting in the wings here, ready to take over. And then <clears throat> I will have an interview interview with Voice of America Chief White House Correspondent Stephen Herman. Super excited to talk uh, with him uh, with everything going on on the national level and the presidential election and so forth. It's going to be a very interesting conversation, I hope. And uh, as you saw with the slides, we would like to recognize the many longtime Progress Seminar sponsors. Today we want to give a special thanks to our session sponsor, Dignity Health Sequoia Hospital. Apart from their ongoing support of the Progress Seminar, they are a committed partner, active in local causes and initiatives, and quite frankly, a bedrock community institution at this point. And they have been asked to do much more during this extraordinary uh, time of pandemic. Thanks again to Dignity Health Sequoia Hospital for all of their good work in our community. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Josh Becker. He was just elected to the California State Senate representing San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County in that uh, august body, the upper house, uh, we like to call it in Sacramento. And uh, he'll be sworn in on December 7th. In fact, he just went through uh, the orientation process uh, at the Capitol. So uh, he is uh, newly minted here and looking forward to working with him. Uh, with an entrepreneurial mindset, innovative approach, and policy-focused goals, Josh will bring a fresh perspective to the state capitol. I look forward to working with him as we tackle our region's challenges. This is his very first progress seminar, and I'm sure uh, it's the first of many more to come in the future. And with that, let me turn it over to Senator-elect Josh Becker. Great to see you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to Kevin. Thank you to the chamber. Thanks to all the organizers. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, to be here. When I talk to Kevin and Mario uh, about uh, what we should discuss and who we should bring, I kept throwing out ideas and Mario said, oh, that's great. Yeah, that was, that's good. That's great. And so really, I um, said, uh, we couldn't decide. So we said, let's bring together a group of really fantastic uh, leaders across jobs, across innovation, um, across uh, diversity, um, and just have some quick conversations with them and get some input uh, that will hopefully be useful to all of you and interesting um, and will be thought-provoking, I, I know, for me as I consider what legislation to introduce, and hopefully will maybe jog some ideas uh, that you have for me um, for um, what you would like to see uh, me do and in, in the state Senate and what kind of issues you'd like to focus on. So um, I really appreciate this opportunity and I'd like to first uh, welcome Nick DePorter and Alan Blue uh, with us here. Um, and uh, Alan Blue is one of the co-founders of LinkedIn and has been VP of product management and run product strategy from the very beginning. Um, he's also been particularly responsible for the education related projects uh, at LinkedIn and he's an expert, as I love, on data and has served as an advisor to the U.S. government uh, on data and data policy. And Nick DePorter um, runs state and local public policy for LinkedIn and has some fascinating data that he will uh, share with us here today. So first, Alan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Um, and for um, Alan, I'd like to start out um, and uh, tell us a little bit about the origin story at LinkedIn. How did, how did it, everyone loves to hear the origin story. I don't think I've ever actually asked you. Um, how did it happen? How, can you tell us about the founding of LinkedIn? Uh, sure, happy to talk about it. It's a, uh, uh, it's actually a pretty, uh, it's, it's one of those kind of unique Silicon Valley stories as all of them are. Um, <clears throat> In 1997, uh, I had started a dating site with a guy called Reed Hoffman, and I'm sure you all know who Reed is. And um, and we worked together on that, and we both worked on PayPal for a while. And we had learned a lot of lessons at those two companies about 
the uh, the power of networks. Uh, it was key to making both of the both the dating site and PayPal uh, and a lot of other things successful. Uh, being able to reach out to people who you know, people who you are willing to help, and people who are willing to help you is key to uh, uh, not only starting a company, but basically so much that occurs in our careers and in our lives. Uh, and we even have data about this now that LinkedIn is almost 20 years on. We have uh, uh, been able to observe this phenomenon within LinkedIn's data, how important that network is to being successful. So we started the company up. Uh, with the intention of making sure that everybody in the world could have a network as powerful as the ones that we had in Silicon Valley. Um, and over the years, we were able to not only connect a bunch of people together, but also uh, implicitly and then explicitly connect companies, connect schools, connect jobs and information all together uh, into uh, a huge world spanning network, which we call the economic graph. From that, we are able to uh, look at a global level, at a country level, and even at a local level about the things which uh, are happening inside the economy. We have a really unique view, which is provided by our members and the companies and schools who use LinkedIn on a regular basis. It's a great augmentation to the kind of data we're used to looking at about the way our economy and society work. Yeah, good. And I want to get to the data in a minute. Before I do, I mean, just did you ever think it's amazing? It was only 20 years ago. And I remember that small <laughs> office, um, you know, out near Google. I mean, do you ever think it would grow to be this big? <laughs> I don't think you ever think that your company is going to turn into a, uh, uh, a company with 10,000, 20,000 employees, but I do think you think you're going to change the world. And, and certainly we thought that at the early days of LinkedIn. Yeah. Well, that's great. We certainly are. So I want to bring Nick on. Let's get to the data because, Nick, uh, you have some fascinating data to share for us uh, about the Bay Area and which job categories are growing, um, which, what kind of transitions is happening uh, in the job market, what kind of skill level. And this will just be a, a taste. We're not going to do a super deep dive, but can you kind of – are you able to pull this up? And by the way – since we have a lot of guests, we'll bear with us if there's any technical difficulties. But Nick, can you show that uh, for us? There you go there. Can you see my screen? Yep, we can see it and hopefully um, people can see it in enough depth. But yeah, please walk, we'll take a, take a few minutes and really walk us through this because this is fascinating. So we've been producing these uh, now, we've been calling them now casting reports for policymakers um, in regions and states and countries. Uh, ever since the beginning of, of the pandemic. Uh, we've certainly been doing it pre-pandemic, uh, uh, but this really put a test to see how we can really um, impact the workforce with our insights. So we collated the most important things uh, in a most timely uh, manner. So we were looking at in-demand jobs, career transitions, the skills that play into those jobs and those career transitions. So we've been sharing these reports that you're seeing here with about uh, 30 cities and about 30 different uh, U.S. states, and they've all been leveraging them in different ways. So this report you're seeing here is of the San Francisco Greater Bay Area, and is completely informed by our member data, uh, which you can see down here is uh, we have 5 million members uh, in, the, in the Greater Bay Area. Of course, we have great representation. Uh, we'll always put up there on top how you can use these insights. Um, really, I think where we're seeing anecdotally, uh, hearing a lot of workforce, uh, frontline workforce agencies, career counselors, uh, those working in those uh, wraparound services in some cities, where really they're just trying to get people back to work, are overlaying this data on top of their data to see uh, what's going on um, out there and see what opportunities may exist. Uh, I will, of course, send this report around so you all can click through the links uh, at, at, your, at your leisure. So 5 million members, uh, 172,000 companies. We're not saying there's 172,000 companies in the greater Bay Area, but that's how many companies are represented on member profiles. We know with the rise of the gig economy, many, many members have multiple companies uh, on their profile, and that's why the, the number is very large. All 30, 36,000 skills uh, that we have 
um, collated on the site are in use uh, there. That means the things that you add to your profile, like Python or Microsoft Office, are all there in play. And then 44,000 schools. Similar to the companies, uh, not all those schools exist there. That's just how many educational institutions those 5 million members went to. Uh, we did a big undertaking over the past year where we ingested all U.S. high schools as well. Mm. So we're seeing a lot of people posting their high schools, uh, and that's also presented a good value proposition for uh, those without a four-year degree to come check out LinkedIn. Um, here you're seeing the LinkedIn hiring rate. This is uh, essentially an average of members who actually got jobs over a certain time period. So we're measuring that uh, versus the United States. You can see here how um, San Francisco has shared. Uh, you can see the actual dips, and you can, you can actually mark the dates on the calendar when you see um, some of the shutdowns. Uh, we've been seeing that over the past few months uh, and seeing how volatile um, that, could, that could truly be. Um, next part is we're looking at top industries. So right off of job, um, pro, job postings, we're seeing what are the top industries that are actually hiring now. No big surprise there, um, except you know we think healthcare is obviously very high and education is high on everybody's list. Software and IT services, uh, of course, grow in the Bay Area, is, is always a growing industry, but we think that's also applying to the healthcare space and education since so much have gone virtual. So this next page is actually just a, a fun page that our data team has been uh, adding data cuts to that they find interesting. And the one thing that they've been looking at is gender. We've all heard and we know that women have been disproportionately impacted by the onset of the virus. So we wanted to see what hiring looked like historically. So we looked at um, um, overall gender hiring uh, pre-COVID, uh, during COVID, and then over the last month. So it's actually, in San Francisco's case, uh, at a place where uh, the hiring of women have increased to pre-COVID numbers. So it's going in a positive direction, and we're seeing that, um, we're, we're seeing that across the United States. Uh, the next look is at high-growth firms. This is what we're calling um, entrepreneurial companies. So we hear a lot from policymakers that we want to be like Silicon Valley, we want to be like the Bay Area. Um, so we're looking at high growth firms in these in regions to see um, how are they growing uh, during COVID and then post COVID. Now we're going to get into the good stuff. This is the fast growing job. So we are actually uh, collating the, the jobs uh, directly off of our site. Um, I think you know uh, one of the ways, uh, one of our lines of business is, is job postings, but we also ingest jobs. So we get a good picture of what the workforce looks uh, across the board. So we did a healthcare um, and a non-healthcare uh, cut of this, and you can see the top skills associated uh, with those jobs. Uh, this, is a, this is one of the key tools that we're seeing workforce uh, agencies use because we just launched a tool called Career Explorer, which I'll share a link in the chat, where you can actually enter a skill and then the job will come up and you can see where your job, your skills may match up a little bit better. And then finally, our final section is on career transitions. Uh, we looked at members who actually made a move over that month. Um, we picked out a few jobs. What, what job did they move into? What was their previous job? Um, at what rate is this transition happening um, you know, across the entire uh, workforce? And then we looked at the skills similarity, which is, again, a really important number that we're monitoring because it's, it's giving people ideas of jobs they can get into because of so much skill similarity. And then finally, the most important part is training investment because uh, we want to note that there is you know, certainly a training investment to go from pharmacy tech to pharmacist, uh, and we want to make sure that's noted. So these reports, um, to um, Mr. Becker's point, we've been sharing over the past um, seven months. We plan to continue to do so. Um, some of the trends that we're seeing, of course, are an increase in um, the search for remote work. Uh, the remote filter has been turned on uh, quite a bit more. Uh, by our members since 60% more uh, since the beginning of March. So people are looking and we're gonna interested to see how that's gonna impact uh, the overall workforce and the flow of these reports. Happy to answer questions or save them to the end, whatever works best. 
Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. And um, it's great. I, you know, I had never seen this kind of data before, and it was great to hear when you and I talked earlier that you're, first of all, willing to share this report, and I will sync up with uh, the Chamber and Mario afterwards to see how we can uh, get this to you, but you can either request it from me directly or um, request it from Mario in the Chamber, and we will get this uh, data to you. And then you're going to hopefully, even over time, even get more granular, right, on a region basis. Um, as well as I think you're going to do some fun stuff on a state level that I'm really excited to, to, to see. So um, we may have time for one or two very quick questions. So if you want to put that in, uh, please go ahead and do so. And I'm going to turn back to uh, Alan for a moment. Um, Alan, you know, one of the issues um, is, you know, a lot of uh, jobs and job search is around networking. And, and some of that, you know, traditionally obviously has taken place in person. Um, and now we are all isolated. How, how can people think of LinkedIn as a resource? Um, and how can all of our constituents for all the electeds here think of uh, LinkedIn as a resource um, around job searching and staying connected uh, professionally while they're isolated? That's a great question. And it's something that we have seen across all of our uh, product lines. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, when uh, we uh, when the when the pandemic hit, um, we saw a huge uptake in the usage of our Sales Navigator product. Sales Navigator is a product which allows uh, salespeople to do prospecting uh, <clears throat> and to maintain their relationships with their existing customers. Um, because that's something which typically had been done in person, people had to turn online to make it happen. Uh, so. Uh, I think probably the hardest shift that people need to consider is going from communicating with people uh, in the real world, which is something where we're all communicating with our professional networks, using people we work with uh, in the office, and just taking that online, reminding yourself to go do it. Um, LinkedIn, because you've represented your professional network there, is actually a really good mechanism for doing that. So you can go in and you find all the people who you know. Um, and what's more, uh, you can make it clear to them that you're willing to help them uh, with whatever uh, searches, whether it be for a job or for business that they're trying to achieve. Um, so the hardest thing to do is to try to do something which typically has been just a part of working with your colleagues, but taking that online. Uh, uh, LinkedIn is a good mechanism to do it, but uh, you know, in, in the end, I think the the key bit for you and for all of us is uh, to remember that just because we're separate physically um, uh, doesn't mean that we need to forget that the relationships around us are still core to our future success. Right. And, and as we wrap up, w one last thought, because um, I realize we actually have our next guest, and fortunately there's no questions. I'm sure people will probably be following up with us directly. Um, but w when, one last thought from you, Ellen, is you should reflect on this data and you reflect on this sort of skills piece, which is increasingly reflected in LinkedIn, and, what, and you think about what skills are, are necessary to kind of transition from one to the other, and you looked at that job data that we just went through. Um, how do you think of this, uh, you know, this period as a way for people to kind of grow their skills and how can they kind of reflect that on, on LinkedIn? Um, you know, Nick alluded to a little bit, but as people think about job transitions and as our constituents who are out of work think about this, um, just a quick thought from you on how, how can we um, use LinkedIn to think about that, that skills element? What skills do I need for this job? Uh, how can I get those skills and how can I showcase the skills that I have? Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the things which has been kind of kind of the most amazing findings coming out of our data recently is showing how uh, transitions, especially into into technology work. So, uh, when you look at the fastest growing jobs, these clusters of jobs where uh, we think that the greatest growth is likely to occur, those jobs are almost entirely technology jobs or technology enabled jobs. So it could be a marketing job, but it's a technology enabled marketing job, or it could be something hardcore technology like machine learning or data science. Um, the fascinating things about that is that the transitions, especially at the cutting edge of these uh, new roles, like for instance, if you want to become a data scientist or you wanted to become an artificial intelligence expert, those jobs are new. And most of the people taking those jobs 
right now don't have specific preparation for that job. So there isn't already a set of skills that you know you need to have because those jobs are brand new. So that means there are people coming from all different backgrounds to take those roles. We know, for instance, that among data scientists, a lot of people are coming from training in the hard sciences to move into those roles. So the great thing is that at the cutting edge of technology, there's a lot of openness to bringing in people who come from variety, a variety of backgrounds. So really think about those possibilities, these things which are, which are new and cutting edge and may sound out of reach are actually a lot closer than you think. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and that will be really important, I think, for all of us as we go forward. I know talking to a lot of the candidates for the community college board here, a lot of the focus was on kind of rapid retraining. And I was talking to the community colleges for a while about, again, how do we make those uh, connections better uh, between the jobs that are available here um, and these students. So that is a very optimistic uh, message to end on, Alan, the fact that these, even these most cutting edge jobs, there's not one set of skills, there's openness and people can come in and take those. So I wanna thank both of you very much. Alan, I know you've got a very important meeting uh, with Reed coming up. I appreciate you uh, being here. Nick, it was great to get to know you. Thank you for sharing that fascinating, fascinating data. I've been on the state workforce board for seven years. I've never quite seen data like that. So I look forward to getting that and showing, sharing that up in Sacramento as well. Thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we have our next guest, uh, Sukinder Singh joining us. Um, so we can get her up on the video. And Sukinder, I've known for a long time, but I have some notes about some of the amazing things that uh, she has done. And we've been friends, fortunately, for a long time. And it's great to have you here. She was most recently the president of StubHub, which sold in, I guess, what can only be considered very good timing um, back in February for about $4 billion. So congratulations um, on that. Um, but before that, she had... Um, many roles in founding companies and scaling companies and uh, roles at companies like uh, Google and Amazon and others. Um, and what was, is really amazing about Sukinder is she then took it upon herself to start something called the board list. So we talk a lot about uh, diversifying the workforce, diversifying Silicon Valley. Um, and um, it was something I talked a lot about in, in, in my campaign. And so Kinder took it upon herself to do that. And you know, one of the issues is people were defaulting to people that they knew, right? People that were already um, folks that they knew had served on a board previously. And then she realized there's all these uh, skills out there, all these women particularly, which was the start of the board list, who had all these skills necessary to serve on these boards, but how to make that discovery part um, uh, easier. And um, in doing that, then she got nominated for this new California task force that she'll tell us about uh, as well. So, so Kinder, first, welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. Thanks, Josh. Good to see you all. Yeah. I just wanted to first, maybe you could share with us, tell us a little bit kind of about your career. I remember the Yodley days uh, way back in the, in, the, uh, in the late 90s. I mean, how did you kind of get involved in technology and companies and, and you know, any reflections as you sort of kind of took on increasing leadership roles? Sure. Um, and I think I'll try and tie it to this conversation because talking about my background in abstract, maybe it's useful, maybe it's not. Um, I'm Canadian, one well, obviously Indian by origin, grew up in Canada, moved to the, uh, the U.S. and then the U.K. And I came to California in 1997, believe it or not, for the weather. Um, <laughs> and because I knew, how to be, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I didn't really know how. I was in investment banking and media previously. Uh, and it turns out, of course, as I will say to people, that coming to California in 1997 to be an entrepreneur was pretty good timing, unbeknownst to me, uh, when we think about sort of the confluence of kind of internet usage, right, uh, starting to inflect up even further. Uh, I ended up starting my own, uh, I ended up at a startup that got sold to Amazon and then started my own company called Yodely, which was a fintech company that went public in 2015. Uh, and then made my way to Google, where I, for six years I ran APAC and LATAM. Uh, and also launched Google Maps and Local. Uh, in about 2009, I uh, ended up uh, choosing to be an entrepreneur again. Uh, I was the CEO of a startup called Polyvore, which sold to Yahoo, and then had uh, two of my own companies, Joyous, which was very early for its time and did not yield a particularly successful outcome in trying to be the first video shopping network, which is very in vogue today, but in 2010 was quite early. Uh, and then started the board list, as Josh knows, in mid-2015, frustrated with tech 
kind of tech diversity, uh, and uh, particularly at the top levels of tech. And uh, most recently, I ran StubHub, which we sold. But I think the through line for all of you, and I think for myself and my own lessons, are really that you know we're in a work environment where we want to give people mobility, but mobility means knowing how to take risk. And mobility, I think in the case of people uh, with less opportunity means making it safe to take risk and solving problems, uh, you know, that make it possible for people to enter new, path enter new pathways and jobs. Um, and, you know, as you progress in your career, even for me, right, the notion of risk taking and how to make risk uh, not scary, but, you know, I would say uh, help people learn how to move into adjacent and open opportunities is probably something I learned how to navigate in my career right, between big and small and using my own networks to get where I wanted to go. But I think a lot actually about risk taking, to be honest, in my mm -hmm. own career and, and for others. And how do you make it safe and, uh, uh, and possible for people to take some career risk in order to find more mobility? So that's probably the through line in my career that's worth thinking about here. And obviously, the other one is equity and inclusion. And how do you make it possible for everyone to participate in an ecosystem, not just some people disproportionately? Yeah, well, along those lines, so tell us about the board list. How'd you decide to start it? And t tell people a little bit about what it is. Sure. So the board list, think of it as LinkedIn for boards. It's really a uh, talent marketplace where people who already have board experience nominate diverse talent. So today the board list is for people of color and women uh, that they know in their networks who they think would be fantastic for boards. And as a result of pooling and aggregating really great supply through recommendations, then boards who are looking for diverse board members come to the board list and start a search and can discover, they can run a search for free today and discover um, uh, you know, a diverse set of candidates who they know have been recommended for board positions. Uh, the board list is five years old. We've helped about 2,000 companies uh, do board searches uh, so far. We're about 16,000 members, that's organic. Um, and I think we, uh, we actually are a for-profit company. We just raised our first series seed. Uh, it closed two days ago, <laughs> not public, but closed in order to keep making matches and discovery happen at greater scale and obviously use technology to do that. Um, and it turns out at the board list that, you know, there are multiple problems you're trying to solve. First, as you pointed out, Josh, is trusted discovery. And that's actually a big opportunity still today because people continue with this notion that they're not enough qualified candidates. But if you look further, it's also things like, again, bringing it back to this conversation and the LinkedIn conversation, at the board list, we worry about things about how do people like talk about their competencies? How do you even create mobility for an executive into the boardroom, mm -hmm. right? These are all mm -hmm. questions of mobility. And I might be dealing with them at a different level, let's say right now, today it's the boardroom, tomorrow it's the C-suite. The board list is sort of coming out at top down to try and change the power structures of some of these companies. But at the end of the day, I think we're all looking for the same thing, which is we want to translate all that we've achieved into competencies that we can then, again, translate into new opportunity and new risks. And I think the board list is trying to do that at scale uh, for executives uh, who are diverse. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, again, particularly relevant here as I'm in the chamber uh, offices. And um, as you're talking, I feel like, you know, we, we need a board list for, uh, for the public sector, for boards and commissions, you know, here throughout, throughout, the, through, throughout the county. <laughs> Although many, you know, many uh, boards and commissions are doing a good job, but, um, but we could always use uh, this kind of tool. But then how did you get involved in California and, and how is public policy, obviously, you know, public policy at the state level has tried to help and, and do you see that? Um, already having an impact? you think that will have an impact? And, and uh, I know you're new to this board diversity task force, but what can you tell us? Sure. Well, um, I am the founder and chair of the board list, so I have a full-time CEO, and she was involved early on when the California proposition to kind of uh, mandate uh, inclusion on boards came to pass. So she and my co-founder and the CEO of the board list actually has been very involved. I more recently came to the task force. It's called uh, CPP, and you know the first lady is running a task force to think about what's the next what's the next phase. Uh, of thinking about uh, board diversity and inclusion. I will say, Josh, a couple of things. First of all, when I started the board list, I was not a fan of quotas for all the same reason everybody else is, right? You, you hope that people self-regulate and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you also hope that even implementation of a Rooney rule, will, you know, i.e. creating diverse slates, will create the right outcomes. But it is true that when, and I've served on boards internationally and in the US myself, I've served on uh, several different boards, it is true that when you look at um, two types of policy, number one, 
quotas in Europe. And number two, uh, comply, uh, comply or explain, which is really more Canada and the UK's approach, which it was just like just reporting on board metrics. And if you're not meeting the thresholds and goals, literally explaining why. Um, those things do drive action. So in California, um, so people are aware, since the passing of the bill, 669 women have been added to boards in Cal of California-run companies, headquartered mm -hmm. companies. And so it has been the biggest increase, of obviously, ever in diversity on boards. Um, and, and my belief today is that the Rooney Rule may not be enough. Mm. Uh, we do need further policy to move the ball forward. And I, I have gone from thinking of it as sort of a negative to, you know, look, somebody put it well to me, actually, I think not on the task force, but a uh, uh, business CEO. It's not the question whether there's a quota. The real issue is how you treat people when you bring them onto your board. If you treat it as tokenism, it will be tokenism. Mm -hmm. By the way, whether a quota exists or not. If you, you know, if you invite them to participate and create an inclusive board, looking to get the most yield out of every board member, including diverse board members, and you know, in creating um, a situation where you're not the only on a board, so it isn't really tokenism that you, you know, you have a board that's you know fully representative then I think the issue of quotas are not, it, like, it, it's just a means to an end, right? So people sort of point at quotas and talk about tokenism. But the reality is, if a board is going to treat this like a token gesture, they're going to do that whether a quota exists or not. Mm -hmm. um, and what we really want to, obviously, is for boards to recognize that there's better performance when you have not just one, but actually, you know, several diverse members on your board who diversify the thinking of that group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what do you think, you know, just in the, in, in the, um, scale of progress, um, you know, here in Silicon Valley, I mean, where do you think, do you think we're still in the, I guess in, this is, um, well, in a baseball nine inning game, I mean, do you think we're, we're where, where are we, uh, what inning are we in? And, and, uh, and just to talk about what progress we've made. Well, let's put it this way. We're probably at inning two or three. We're not at inning one. And that's because if you look at the Fortune 500 and the largest companies in the world, board diversity has actually increased tremendously. The issue has historically been board terms, but a disproportionate, a majority of new open board seats are going to diverse candidates, if you include women and people of color. And so the stats are quite good, even in the Fortune 500. But the issue is what I identified, which is in the largest companies, it's not enough to have one. You want to get to the place where diverse thinking is just a part of the boardroom. It's not that your diverse members are standing out. It's just, you know, and we know that happens when there are two or three people uh, that are diverse, if you cease from going to be from being the one expected to carry the burden for diversity to just being mm -hmm. another board member who's bringing a diverse perspective. So I think in public company boards, you actually do have good basic representation that we need kind of uh, to permeate the idea that boards are diverse. It's not about having one slot. Boards are diverse when they have diverse thinking and you cease to be the only. And then, of course, I'd say we're only at inning two or three because private companies have tremendous opportunity to diversify their boards early. Nonprofit and profit. Nonprofits actually tend to be better uh, entry, entry points uh, than for-profit private companies uh, in embracing diverse thinking. Um, just because in some ways they tend to, you know, take cor corporate governance a lot more seriously than early stage private company boards. Yeah. And I should mention a couple of the boards that you've uh, sat on. You sit at Urban Outfitters now and Upstart, and previously at Ericsson, TripAdvisor, Stitch Fix, J. Crew, um, and as a strategic advisor to Twitter. And a couple of things. You, I, I, I don't need to impress you with Sukita's background at this point, but I will tell you she was also named one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company, one of the top 100 people in the Valley by Business Insider, um, and uh, a, a profile by Wall Street Journal. Forbes, Fortune, many others. So I did want to get that in there. Um, and how can people, um, and I've been, I was proud to be an early advisor, I guess, to the board list. Um, tell people how, you know, if, if people here want to nominate folks in their communities for boards, can you tell people how they uh, do that on the board list? Sure, it's really simple. If you're somebody who thinks you're qualified for a board and would like to serve, you can actually go to the board list and apply, and then you will get a uh, an email requesting that you go out to your community and find endorsements from people who already have board experience and invite them to endorse you. Or, you know, if you want to nominate someone simply and you have board experience, and that can be, you know, board experience of private or public companies, you can go to the board list and nominate someone and apply to be what's called an endorser, which really just says, hey, I have board experience and uh, I would really love to recommend someone. So it's quite simple. The nomination process is, you know, is fairly easy. You could do it in five minutes. And we're, what we're really looking is we're not collecting sort of 
you know, deep diatribes on people. What we're looking for is sort of that nod, right? That I think this person is qualified and you can identify what stage of board you think they'd be qualified for. Uh, mm-hmm. Early, mid, later, public, depending yeah. on your experience. But this is how you identify emerging talent also, obviously, because we want to be pipelining, you know, people to serve on boards. And uh, as many of you know, your first board experience may be an advisory board, it may be a nonprofit board, it may be a private board. So you definitely want to be... Um, offering people the opportunity to nominate across multiple types of boards. Yeah, yeah. What's it like being on one of those big, I've never done that, being one of these big public company boards? Is it, is it a whole <laughs> different animal than private companies? Or what, what's it? It, it? it is, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it the most glamorous animal. You spend a lot more time in corporate governance. I think we all think that the biggest boards are the most fun, but the reality is uh, we're all pretty privileged to get to work with private companies where 90% of the board energy is about strategy and growth. And 10% is about, you know, bureaucracy. <laughs> and I think on large, large boards, the large best public boards, of course, you have just, uh, I would say it's a really fun dialogue when you talk about strategy, you just spend a good amount of your time talking about governance. And um, so that balance has shifted. Uh, the upside, of course, is you get to work with really great brands and you get to work with extraordinary people. Yeah. And as you said, when you talk about pipeline, you said a lot of it does start at, and you'll start out at the private company level, right? Or start at a startup, even an advisory board and, and such. And, and do you feel there we're making progress with the, say, the venture sector? And, you know, do you think people are um, kind of recognizing this? And, and what actually can you say, and, and, and even, you know, post George Floyd, have you seen an increased uh, interest and focus? I mean, I certainly saw a lot of posts about this from Fens in the Valley. Do you feel that people are really taking diversity more seriously? Yes, look, I think that what I would say about the board list, obviously we've been running it for five years and you know bootstrapped before we raised funding. So I've gotten a chance to see what's happened over the past five years. I would say a couple of things. Number one, there is a tailwind that also uh, around diversity and inclusion that's not going anywhere. We all know this, that the issues of equity are not, they're never done. And in fact, I think the ferocity, which with their, which with their being brought to attention is increasing with the, you know, I would say the income divide and, and economic inequality divide in this country. So I don't think these issues are going anywhere. And so as a result, because it is in the mainstream media, I would say venture capitalists um, and certainly earlier stage companies have taken them seriously. I think you have a whole generation of founders who understand that if you want to build a diverse company, it's best to start early. And so they look for diverse co-founders and they, and many of them, I, I would say we, the board list is 75% of the searches are for private companies, which mm-hmm. I find encouraging because it's telling you that founders care earlier. Now, some of those companies care just because they're about to go public, but a good portion of them are really series A and series B companies. So I think overall there is a shift to earlier and there is like, and that, that trend is, go, is not going anywhere. Whenever you have a cultural crisis, Me Too and George Floyd, the board list spikes. There's no doubt. I mean, Board uh, requests for diverse uh, board searches on the board list quadrupled this year Mm -hmm. from our run rate in January into October. So definitely, uh, you know, social justice um, and I would say equity and inclusion at the cultural level do show up in the business ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know this, too, because it also prompts, you know, stories of bad behavior to, you know, show up in the business ecosystem as well. And so whether negatively from negative or positive sentiment, negative sentiment does drive, I have to say it, unfortunately, more attention and I'd say spikes. But I'm encouraged by the fact that the progress on the board list has been pretty steady. And even when there's not a crisis, you know, we do see this continued trend to earlier and um uh, and founders really understanding that diversity has to be built in from the beginning. Yeah. Well, that's great. Because I remember, and again, it's, and it's so fun to think, yeah, it's only five years old. And it's just a, another incredible example of innovations that start here in, in our area, in our district. And, um, but I remember those early days. And I remember when I posted about it and people, uh, a lot of my, uh, a lot of my kind of women entrepreneur friends would say, hey, you know, I want to be on here. This is great. Like, this is so needed. And, you know, how do I get on? And, and so we saw the energy from the beginning. And then, um, of course, the, the spikes more recently. Um, let's just turn to nonprofit boards for a moment. And we may have a special guest joining in a moment. But so I wanted to kind of transition to the nonprofit boards. And you've been involved in Job Train forever. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about job train and why did you get involved? Sure. Well, well, first of all, my first board experience came here in, in Silicon Valley at job train. And I was invited to join the board by another Silicon Valley executive, uh, Bud Colligan, who also has mm. been involved, I think, locally yeah. for years. 
uh, Silicon Valley Community Bank and others as you, or a community, uh, Silicon Valley Ventures, community ventures. Um, what I would say is job train for me, I, I think this is now year 17 or 18 that I've been involved with job train and now on the strategic advisory board. My feeling about nonprofits boards generally, I mean, great place to get experience um, and great place to make an impact that's proximate to your own community. And so I love that job train gave me my first board opportunity. More importantly, you know, I don't know of any bigger uh, and more important impact than, you know, creating economic mobility here in Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm deeply worried, as I'm sure many of you are, that the gap between the have and the kind of need to have, you know, those uh, consuming services and those providing them is pretty big. And I think job train's more recent focus, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, is really starting to focus not just on the living wage, but how do you think about economic mobility so people can afford to raise families and actually get into, you know, steady and increasing kind of upward job mobility, which I know is a topic you were just covering with Alan. So um, I would just say, uh, I think I, I, I love job training as sort of the physical embodiment of recognizing that people don't just need technologies and courses online. So they really actually need, as we talked about, you know, uh, solving of the very local issues like childcare, transportation, how to get access to a computer in order to take advantage of these many opportunities that Silicon Valley companies, you know, are creating through technology. Like that still needs to be wrapped in a way that people can receive these, you know, services and take advantage of them. And so uh, I think it's important, obviously, for all of us, myself included, you know, I think it's one thing to think about everything you can do through technology, but I think if you don't find a way to apply it to your local community, and really create economic mobility where you live and where you have the benefit of taking advantage of all of these services that, you know, people wake up every day to provide to us. You know, I think we just have to be very, you know, very cognizant of the fact that we live in a service economy and a knowledge economy. And we want to bring those two things together and we want everybody to be able to participate in that. Yeah. Yeah. So important. And this, this, I'm really glad you brought this up. This is definitely top of my list, and I think incumbent on in all of us and all policymakers here uh, in the Bay Area and in San Mateo County to think deeply about economic mobility and how can we help promote economic mobility um, you know, here uh, in the Bay Area. And for me, it starts with early childhood education. We're expecting a big um, uh, sort of announcement from the governor about work he's been doing there. Um, and then you know, continues on up through our education system um, but we need uh, entities like Job Train to um, to help fill that gap. So I actually have a call at, at three o'clock today with with Barry, the head of Job Train, with Larry Moody, um, my friend who works there. So what 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 do you think? Um, do you have any sense of what what policymakers, you know, either locally or at the state level, can do to help um, help the mission of Job Train? Sure, and just I would say Job Train, and more broadly. I think, and I don't know the answer, so I don't subscribe to now, but I think that some combination, and you've hit this, right? We've talked about early, early education, but what I see in a world in which there are many, many private companies attempting to solve the creation of online education content, whether it's Guild, you know, who some of you may or may not know, they're solving, you know, education for employers who want to take uh, their retail and, and restaurant workers and others and give them actually a career path, you know, that's funded entirely by the employer. Whether you're looking at lynda.com, which is a content platform on LinkedIn, I feel like there's lots of tool sets, but for me, I still believe that there's an opportunity for public-private partnership mm -hmm. and figuring out how to use these models at scale in our local community. So even at job training, I'm always talking to Barry, I'm like, what, what content already exists that we can ingest so we don't mm -hmm. have to create it from scratch, you know? Um, um, and meanwhile, he's every day waking up, you know, trying to figure out how to pay his bills, right, as any local nonprofit is doing through a combination of government subsidies and, and private funding. So I think there just have to be models where we can think about how we use what's already been created and tap, tap on and honestly put pressure on, as I know many of you do, the companies in your local communities that are creating so much wealth uh, for their employees and think about how to turn you know, some of their tools and technology to impact their local communities. And I think there are many successful examples of that, I'm sure, that have been done, but uh, more of that is what I believe. Whether And that would benefit job trade too, right? They've been very good about having relationships with, with employers like Facebook and Google and their local communities. But uh, even more so, I think the application of tools and technology uh, to our own local communities is a huge opportunity. And I think, uh, I think uh, the public sector can be a vehicle for that, for creating some of those models. 
Great. Well, this is the perfect transition to talk about your board service. Uh, we have a very special guest joining us, and I was speaking to him yesterday. Josh Friday is the governor's appointment, the first ever chief service officer. So I'm going to have him join us. So Kinder, thank you so much uh, for no. your time today. I really, really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, Josh, thank you for uh, popping in and joining us here today. You and I were uh, chatting yesterday, and I told you about this, and you, you agreed to, to join in. I think that was sort of the perfect segue, talking about uh, Sue Kinder's uh, board service. And really what you're trying to do is uh, create a culture of service, really an, an, uh, the opportunity for and, and goal and hopefully aspiration, I believe, for every high school student um, in California and, um, uh, you know, to have that kind of volunteer experience. Tell us a little bit about the formation of this uh, office and this role. Yeah, I appreciate that, Josh, and thank you for, for having me here, Senator-elect, I should say. Uh, and it's great to be with you all. Uh, my setting, I'm actually at a food bank in Sacramento taking a quick break. We're out here today serving literally thousands of uh, people uh, who are in need during this time. And, um, and I know many of you are working very hard to deal with food insecurity in your community, which has skyrocketed since COVID. Uh, and it's an example of how uh, we need people to step up during this time. We have big issues, big problems, whether it's food insecurity, poverty, uh, homelessness, climate change. And the governor feels very strongly that if we're going to solve these problems, we have to do it by all coming together and we have to call on all Californians to be part of the solution and then empower them to be part of the solution. So my office, uh, as you uh, indicated, is very focused on how do we create service opportunities for every Californian? How do we empower them uh, to be part of the solution? And then really, how do we unite people and bring them together in their communities to solve big problems? So uh, we have been leading the effort in, in helping support food banks with volunteers. Since COVID started, we've we've supported over 100 million meals with volunteers uh, efforts uh, uh, throughout the state. And I know in your community, uh, we, uh, food banks have stepped up in a major way. Um, and then we've also just launched a, a great new program that I'm excited to work with uh, with you, Senator, on and others, uh, which is the country's first statewide climate action core, which is calling on every Californian to to take climate action. Uh, and we're building out the infrastructure through both a fellowship program, but also the tech infrastructure with Volunteer Match and other platforms to give every Californian the tools and the education to be able to actually engage in their community and mobilize. So we think we're building something special. It's a big vision the governor has, uh, but the truth is, is that we, we, we all need to be uh, coming to the table and working hard uh, to solve these problems. and. And our hope is, is that we can inspire people and empower them. Well, thank you. It's really, I'm just really excited to introduce you and this office and this mission to people who don't uh, know about it. And I appreciate what the chamber's done, what so many of the elected leaders on this, on this call I, I know have done um, during the COVID crisis and with the, what the Labor Council has done. I've been out with the Labor Council with my daughter many uh, Thursdays uh, delivering hundreds and hundreds of meals um, to, uh, to folks. Um, talk a little bit, and so we'll, we will have you back hopefully to talk more about this kind of going forward, but um, any thoughts about how, how can we, how can the elected leaders, how can we in, in San Mateo County um, be partners with this new office? How can we work with you to uh, encourage uh, volunteerism? Yeah, great question. I appreciate you asking that. And the, the truth is that there's a lot of ways because we know uh, our, we think about our job is to help you empower your communities as well. Uh, and so one, we want your ideas on how best to do that. But we would love to partner with you specifically on this very new, exciting initiative, the California Climate Action Corps, uh, and have San Mateo be a leader in, uh, in mobilizing people around climate action and giving them real things to do to, to be part of the solution. And so uh, we'd love to be in touch with all of your offices and your different jurisdictions on, on how we can do that, how we can engage people. And then the truth is, uh, for us to get to that culture change, uh, Senator, that you spoke about, um, on uh, where, where we're expecting people to serve and we're, we're asking them to serve, that's gonna take all kinds of leaders uh, to do that. It's going to take labor leaders calling on people to serve, business leaders calling on people to serve, university leaders. Uh, we need all of civic society 
uh, to step up and say, this is really a time in our country where we have to come together. We have to unite and let's do it around solving problems together in our communities. Uh, so, so having you all step up as leaders doing that and then uh, working with us and, ask, and, and, and talking to us about how we can support your efforts uh, would be tremendous. But let's, uh, let's solve climate together. Uh, let's solve uh, food insecurity together. Um, and, uh, and we should be able to, to get a lot done. Yeah, well, those are big aspirations. And of course, it's not just high school students. It's, it's really for every Californian. But I did tell you about uh, Menlo Atherton High School, where my kids go, has a fantastic service learning program. And I'm going to, uh, you know, connect you up there. And, and, you know, hopefully that's, you know, one of many models that we can help uh, share with you. How can people in, and, and well, I'll connect with the Board of Supervisors on the, um, on the Climate Action Corps. Um, how can people in general uh, learn about your office? How can they, um, you know, use what you're doing to help encourage? I know my daughter got a certificate this summer yeah. from the yes. office for her volunteerism at hitting a certain number of hours, which was great and very, you know, uh, inspirational. How can people here learn about your office and the work that's going on? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and your daughter was one of the leaders uh, in the state and stepping up to, uh, as part of our summer service program that we started uh, last summer to, to meet the needs of our food banks and, uh, and for low-income communities around the state. But we want to encourage everyone to go to Californians for All ca.gov where you'll learn about the work that my office at California Volunteers is leading. It's an initiative that the governor launched. Uh, again, californiansforall.ca.gov. You can also go to climateactioncorps.ca.gov to learn more specifically about climate action. And we're at the point right now where we're literally building out the infrastructure and we want to build that out with you. We want to build it out with local elected leaders. We want to build it out with business leaders. We want to build it out with labor leaders. So this is a time where uh, we want you to, to be in touch with us and again, to tell us how we can support you as well and empowering others. So uh, visit californiansforall.ca.gov, um, join our listserv, uh, and then also, uh, Senator, if we could set up uh, other times and forums to connect with elected officials and other local leaders uh, in the near future, that would be a tremendous help. Good. And we may even have a little uh, friendly competition, um, as we talked about, with, uh, with other regions. I think that would be great um, to be able to do. Uh, to, um, you know, again, use whatever tools we can to help inspire uh, that leadership. That's well, right. thank yes. you. Yeah, thank Let's you, Jeff. It. It's, by the way, is Udaya on? Or, or, he is on? Okay, sorry, I did not see it's, him here. So so um, I did not see, so I was, I was stalling a little bit because I promised you, you know, I would keep it short because I know you've got work to do, but Udaya is there, so we will transition uh, to, to him and let you go. Uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you all. Look forward to working with you. Bye. Great, great. Um, great. Well, it's my great privilege uh, uh, to announce our, our, our last guest. And um, Uday, I apologize for not getting to you a little earlier. I didn't see you on my little screen here, but I appreciate you uh, joining. So Udaya is a um, local San Mateo County resident, and he is the first ever uh, head of digital, uh, digital innovation uh, in California. So Governor Newsom created this office. He appointed Udaya. Um, Udaya has many talents, uh, but has really been a leader in innovation uh, for many years. He's smiling because we were both doing quarantine karaoke last night. So I can speak to his, <laughs> his many, many talents. Um, and uh, but I really appreciate you being here today. Tell us a little bit, how did this office get going? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a pleasure to be here. And again, uh, congratulations to uh, uh, Senator-elect uh, uh, Josh Becker. It's, it's, a, it's a real honor and, uh, and some great panels that you've had today. Um, uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, the, the office started uh, really from uh, Governor Newsom's vision uh, some years ago. Many of you know that he wrote a book called Citizenville that really talked about the ability to use digital tools, uh, digital services, uh, and technology technology to enable a different kind of engagement between government and the people who are voters, who are users of services, who are people who live in the state, who are folks who affiliate with the state and maybe, maybe uh, uh, other people at that point. And, and that idea that we would not only have civic engagement, but really have a constant dialogue between uh, the, the people of the state and government. And so that's really what that book focused on. 
than when he came into office uh, after his stints uh, as a mayor and as a lieutenant governor. He yeah, was really intent on trying to stand that up as a vision and kind of looking around state government and not uh, seeing the ability to fully implement that. Uh, they did the bold move of actually creating a new office, the Office of Digital Innovation, mm -hmm. sitting inside the government operations agency. Uh, and and uh, it's a real priority, I think, for the governor to try to make sure that we can use the power of technology to not only deliver better government programs and services to the people of California, but it's also incredibly important to uh, sort of change the dynamic about how technology and technology services um, are <clears throat> created, procured, and, and uh, deployed at the state level as well. So that's where a lot of that came from. Um, it went through as uh, part of the 2019-2020 budget and then uh, uh, allocated uh, in just about a year ago. Uh, and, uh, and so the team has been working for about a year now, uh, getting very uh, deep into all sorts of different projects that are important for California, is important for the governor, important for the state of California. And, uh, and I've been thrilled to be part of the team uh, uh, joining on uh, just before the start of the summer. And it's a um, it's a uh, a opportune and complicated time to to uh, join in this role. And first of all, it's just so great, and it makes sense that people talk. You know, Kevin spoke about me as, as bringing innovation a bit to Sacramento, to, but to have people from our region, people like you, uh, who are who are who are actually doing that already. Uh, but you joined during a COVID crisis. You joined during the EDD crisis. Um, talk a little bit. I mean, your office, every day the governor gets up there and gives these stats. Talk a little bit about the uh, COVID website and uh, what that's been like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, 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 the story of, uh, of uh, ODI uh, goes back to a year ago where it, they drafted a, a small team of folks to be able to look at the way California delivers services and says there's a better way to actually even have better web presence. Right now, the way that if you need to get services from the state of California, you often uh, have to uh, go to ca.gov and then you have to know which department to go through. And you have to know which office to go to and you, you click, 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 and maybe you find what you're actually looking for. And that's just inefficient and, and ineffective for Californians. And it's frustrating. It's And Californians deserve better. And so the team really worked on creating uh, a new uh, site called alpha.ca.gov. And, and that idea being that that we would just really strip it down to its essence. What are the things that Californians mm -hmm. need to get done and then be able to provide that to them. And so, so all of the technology and for folks that are on the call who have a technology background, all the APIs that they created, all of the templates that they created, uh, all of the technical architecture that they created, they had that ready and then COVID hit. Uh, and so uh, they took all of that and they, and they said, Oh my goodness, COVID is such an important thing. We've got to stand up a, uh, a information and, uh, and uh, data and guidance site as quickly as possible. So the team turned around, took all of those assets, redeployed them immediately, and within five days had one of the country's first uh, really powerful COVID-19 sites up and running. And that became the place for policy updates, guidance updates, public health updates, to give guidance to a lot of different California Californians who are really desperate for information at that point on knowing just what to do. And so that site, covid19.ca.gov, as you said, uh, 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 soon to be Senator Becker, uh, is something that, uh, that the governor uh, references every day uh, in, in his news conferences to, uh, to everybody else. It's the site where those policy updates happen. And that uh, is a site that our team continues to work very closely with CDPH, the California Department of Public Health, uh, as well as the governor's office and, uh, uh, and others to be able to implement uh, over time. And so, so that's something that we're really focused on. And so uh, that's sort of emblematic of one big part of what our job is right now, which is focused on the health of Californians and making sure that's taken care of. But as I like to say, uh, we also have not just the health of Californians, we have the wealth of Californians, and meaning what can we do to actually confront this economic downturn at the same term time, and uh, a lot of it caused by COVID, what can we do to try to put money back in people's pockets? And, and, and you said something important, 
I think, which is that uh, that uh, the work that EDD has been trying to do uh, is is critical about uh, unemployment insurance and uh, even some of those changes that are made at the federal level trying to get those dollars out the door. As many of you saw, uh, there was a big backlog at EDD and there it was a real challenge, it was a real problem. And the governor asked uh, the Secretary of Government Operations, my boss, uh, Yolanda Richardson, who's just a, an amazing uh, visionary leader uh, and uh, really had her put together what's called a strike team, just a bunch of folks who can really look at the problems at EDD very, very quickly, understand that not just from the technology standpoint, but from the process and the people standpoints as well, and the policy standpoints, to try to figure out how we can actually improve the situation there. Uh, that strike team was over the summer and into the early part of September, and the implementation of all that uh, has started. So, so that's the other big part of what we were focused on as well, which is trying to make sure that we focus on uh, on uh, actually getting money into the hands of people who really just desperately need it at this time. So the, the health of Californians with COVID-19, the wealth of Californians with, uh, with unemployment insurance, uh, and of course, uh, a bunch of other programs to try to help out other uh, agencies and departments as well along the way. Yeah, good. Well, I think we'll take, um, can I go a few minutes into the break here? Uh, yeah, okay. Great. So uh, if there are questions, we'll take a couple uh, questions. And actually, we have one here from, um, from Lisa Hicks. Um, how is your office addressing the digital divide each of our communities is experiencing? Yeah, it's, it, it's an excellent point, and, and it's an issue that's pretty important to me. As I like to tell my team and as I tell uh, anybody in state government, digital transformation for the sake of digital transformation is not interesting to me. It shouldn't be interesting to anybody. The reason we do it is to create a more equitable state, and, it's, and that issue of equity is topmost on our agenda. It's topmost on the governor's agenda, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, it's something that we've got to use technology to be able to solve. So that shows up in a few different ways. There's just basic issues of connectivity. How do we actually get reliable, affordable, high-speed internet uh, to more and more places? Uh, not just uh, our disadvantaged communities in our urban areas, but also in our rural areas. How do we get it uh, to folks that, uh, that are just in, in dead spots uh, throughout the communities, uh, as well as also not making assumptions about, uh, about uh, connectivity. Uh, uh, you know, those of us who are on all, all of our home high-speed connections in the valley or are on fiber optic or your 5G uh, uh, phones, uh, th those are great. And, and, but there's a lot of folks who are still on 3G, uh, which is a lower uh, speed technology. And we've got to design our services to be able to support folks like that. And so even the site covid19.ca.gov, when you load it on the lowest end 3G phone, for example, it's meant to load in less than five seconds because every second, every every bit of, uh, of data counts for folks like that. So we want to make it accessible to folks who have bandwidth limitations uh, uh, from a technology standpoint. Uh, and we also want to make it something where digital equity is at, at stake, where we use uh, simple language to be able to explain things. We translate it into half a dozen different languages so that uh, folks of different uh, uh, language backgrounds can be able to understand it. Yeah. Uh, and it also means that we, uh, we make it so it's accessible by people of very different um, uh, abilities. And so, uh, so it includes everything from, uh, from folks of seeing abilities, uh, different seeing abilities to different hearing abilities and what have you. So, so we're really excited about all of those efforts uh, and there's more to come on all of that. So we're really hoping to lean into that over time. Well, thank you. Um, uh, Lisa, that's a, that's a perfect question because that's um, what's on everyone's mind um, as I have two high schools at home right now trying to do distance learning, um, that uh, how all this is affecting and it's brought this issue of digital divide uh, once again to the, to the fore. Um, I'm going to take one or two, one more question if I see one uh, pop up. Otherwise, I will let folks get to break. And I'll just say, Udai, you're, you're, you're here locally. Um, and we probably won't have all the time to get into. You and I talked a lot about you know, how counties on the front line and sharing data between counties and the state and a lot of things you're looking forward to do going forward. I mean, you're, you're new in this role and it's amazing what you've been able to accomplish already, especially uh, nice. during this pandemic time. How can, if elected leaders here in San Mateo County um, want to get in touch with you, get in touch with your office, you know, share ideas with you, how can we make that happen? 
Yeah, the, the, the best ways to be able to do that, um, um, obviously, we're, we're uh, social media presence all over the place. So uh, hit us up on Twitter. Uh, obviously, hit us up. Under on, what? What's uh, the what's the hashtag? What's or what's your uh, uh, the uh, the uh, hashtag for me is uh, uh, is just at Udaya Patnaik. That's at U D A Y A P A T N A I K. So. Uh, uh, hit us up on that. Also, there's going to be a new website for ODI rolling out uh, in the next few weeks, we hope. So uh, uh, right after the Thanksgiving break into December. And we're hoping to have a, uh, a great piece there that allows for a constant dialogue with folks. And so be able to hit us up through the website as well there. And so looking forward to that going online. That'll be through uh, digital.ca.gov. And so hoping, uh, hoping to have that uh, up and running uh, pretty quickly and then hope to have that I'll continue. I guess I would say one thing to all the local leaders. Uh, thank you. Uh, a, a profound sense of gratitude that we have working at the state level that we can't do everything at the state level without deep connections with our local partners, with folks in municipalities, with folks at the county level. Uh, and it's just critical. It's, it's making sure that we're able to actually a lot of these programs because you can put people on the ground. Uh, you have that uh, deep sense of connection there. So, so it's important for us to hear both about the needs that are at there at the local level, for you to be co-designers with all of us for solutions that really make sense for folks in different parts of uh, San Mateo County as well as <clears throat> other parts of the state. Um, and then to actually be able to deliver and deploy and help us tweak and adjust programs along the way. I think uh, those of us in the Valley are very familiar with the idea of iteration and being able to actually get there with successive improvements over time. And I just want to make sure that uh, we have the constant uh, dialogue to be able to do that. So, so thank you uh, for, for the opportunity both today as well as going forward to be able to innovate with all of you. And we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, well, it's really exciting. We're really proud of you. We've had a lot of firsts here today. And you and I have spoken, and we, Josh Friday was our last guest. And one of the goals that I'm hoping to do is let's get folks with, you know, we'll get a, folks with a variety of skills to help out in Sacramento, but get people with technical skills. And when we talk about volunteering and, you know, hopefully we'll come back and we'll have more conversations with you about how do we do that over time and get people with technical skills who want to help a volunteer and let's find some productive ways uh, for them to do that. So we've been very fortunate to have you. We're proud to have you again. And people miss it. ODI is this new office of digital innovation. So we're proud to have you. We have uh, Josh Friday was the first chief service officer, uh, Sukinder Singh, founder of the board list and on the California Board Diversity Task Force. And then we had Alan Blue, one of the founders of LinkedIn, and, and Nick, um, uh, who shared with us uh, some really fascinating data that LinkedIn has come out with. And I don't know if you've seen that. If not, we, I should make sure I share that with you. Some really fascinating data I'd never seen before that LinkedIn is now producing. Uh, it's the first time I think they did it for our region, but they're doing with some cities around the world um, about you know, new jobs that are being created and uh, what skills take and what are the people transitioning from. So I think it's hopefully it's been a fun um, hour for folks. It really, I... Uh, learned a lot and gave me a lot of ideas. If you have other ideas that sprung out of this for me, uh, please reach out to me, becker.josh at gmail. Uh, look for the new website for the Office of Digital Innovation coming soon. And I want to thank Kevin, thank the Chamber, thank Mario, thank you all for having me. And thank the team who did an amazing job here with all the, all, uh, integrating all of our guests. And thank you, Adaya. Thank you. <laughs>